Pardon my French, but Cameron is so tight that if you stuck a lump of coal up his ass, in two weeks you'd have Lou Diamond. Would you like to learn from those that are taking their lives, their businesses, and their passions to the next level? Best-selling author of Speak Easy and master connector Lou Diamond is here to connect you to some of the most inspiring and amazing people on this planet. Get ready to thrive loud with Lou Diamond. Welcome, everyone, to another spectacular episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond, connecting you to the most inspiring and amazing people that are thriving each and every day. I am your host, Lou Diamond. Today on Thrive Loud, we have a globally renowned professional speaker, a multiple times award-winning author and consultant who is driven by the need to elevate the debate and connect dots, ideas, and people to create new patterns. He's written many books. He hosts the Mentor Dialogue podcast and his latest project, The Alagos. Fostering more meaningful conversation is right on par with Thrive Loud and Speak Easy, for that matter. So I'm excited to have him on. Spoiler alert, we told the name of the podcast, but guess what, Thrive Loud listeners? I bring you Minter Dial. Minter, how are you today? Mr. Diamond, I am so glad to be here with you. Another conversation with this individual, listeners will need to know that I was just recently on his amazing podcast program. We got a chance to connect and we got a chance to talk about conversations and all the fun things that we do. And he's coming to us from London, England, although he could be coming to us from someplace in France. But he decided at this point, I'm going to do this this location from London. You know, maybe the satellite signals are better. Who knows? But I'm more impressed with uh, all the things you've done. But I want to share that with the listeners. I want to do a little rewind, Minter. If you could, I don't want to go all the way back to the womb. What I'd like to do is kind of understand how the thing that you're focused on right now became your gig. Well, I didn't get to it right away. It certainly took me a while to sort of figure it out. Like, you know, your mission, your statement, you need to wordsmith it like you did. And I began that mission, if you will, that journey towards living and thriving in my mission uh, on no, September 11, 2001, mm. as I was in my office overlooking the Twin Towers, watched the whole thing happen, including the second airplane fly down. And at that very moment, outside of obviously the catastrophe that was unveiling in front of me, I thought about my grandfather who had been a prisoner of war of the Japanese and very much that feeling which he had to feel as the captain of a ship stuck in the Philippines on December 7, 1941. And it, it was a remarkable echo for me because having studied his life, the number of people who were killed on December 7 in Pearl Harbor and the number who were killed in on September 11, 2001 was remarkably close. Both were plane attacks on American soil. And I could only think about how he had to live through that, obviously much worse than me because he was in the line of fire, ends up becoming a prisoner and is killed. Mm. So what that particular spark moment allowed me to do or made me want to do was to be more authentic with myself, find out really who I am and how can I participate and make that happen at least more than was happening in the past. And so while I worked at L'Oreal for a further eight years, I ended up being on the executive committee. What I, 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 I pushed for more of this purpose within my corporate life. I knew that I had to do it outside to be fully congruent and fulfilling. And that's really the path that I went on wow. to, to try to uh, elevate elegantly the debate. I'll, I'll say this, Minter, we were both in the same uh, location at the same time. Uh, where, just, just going back to 9-11, where were you that day? Well, 47th and 5th. I got you. I was... And I had a corner office with a, a view on the tower. Yeah. And you? 
I was down literally across the street from the Trade Center. So uh, mm. uh, it was when the second plane hit, it cracked the window that I was on because we couldn't mm. see it because it was coming from the other direction. Mm -hmm. So scary right. enough. And, and, and traumatic uh, and, and amazing. Like how I know that that event changed the lives of so many people deciding to take more of a service uh, attitude, go into the military, change their lives, live their purpose. Um, I always find it very interesting that it, it, it takes such severe events in our lives to to flip the switch to, I guess, make sure that we live each day to where we need to. And I, and I want to say over the last 20 some odd years, um, you've been doing a pretty good job of this. So, so when did you um, make that adjustment into outside of corporate and into more of this consulting role and the work that you do and, and share with the listeners a little bit about the work that you did and do? Yeah. So I, 2009 was when I left L'Oreal I, I, at the time I was the youngest person on the board and, uh, I just felt I wasn't going anywhere. And I must say, I made plenty of mistakes as I transitioned into my independent role, having been a corporate executive with services and photocopying machines and, and, and everything to help you, you know, coffee coming straight in. I, I ended up thinking that I had, having been a general manager or managing director, kind of knew a lot about everything. Uh, but it turns out that Google doesn't really like to hire people who think they know a lot about everything. They like to have specialists. Sure. And so while I started off with this broad panoply of, of skills and expertises that I thought that I had, what I needed to do was hone those down. And it, it, that process took me a while. I got some clients right out of the door, having always thought it's important to cultivate a good network, just like you do. <laughs> And uh, that helped me get on my feet, have a first year where actually I had as much revenue as I had in my last year as a, an executive at L'Oreal. And that pattern continued on basically up until the time when I did my documentary film on the Second World War. And so I was working with clients trying to figure out this tra digital transformation thing, but from a very practical angle, because I had been doing that while I was at L'Oreal. It was one of my eight functions was digital hmm. that tells you at some level how little <laughs> digital was important <laughs> for l'oreal that it was one eighth of one person's job at at the company but that that was what i i did i i really focused on on transformation all things digital helping leaders understand how to have a presence on a linkedin on a twitter why and how to have an uh, an executive approach to the way you you deal with yourself online, and um, and then I I really enjoy teaching or at least animating conversations as the tool for learning. So I did a lot of seminars or executive team meetings, using conversation as the tool to extract value, to gain that collaborative intelligence or collective intelligence that is often missing in organizations and. Um, and then I finally got to writing my first book and doing the film in, I did the, I recorded the film in 2014 and it went live in 2016 for Veterans Day mm. uh, along with the book. And that began my new role, creating a new platform for me as a thought leader, even though this book wasn't for business, it really was about being me. And, and that was and retroactively the most important book because it established a lot more helped me to get to understand myself a lot better thinking through the history of my family my relationships with my father sister and my grandfather even though i, or I was named after him even though he died mm. in 1945. I, i've wanted to ask this question because i've had the chance to speak with you twice but i never dove down this line of questioning uh, we had we had somebody who was at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. You're coming to us from London. Um, where did you where where were you born and and where did you live most of your life? Because because obviously as an executive in in many of these companies, you could be bouncing all over the place. But just a little bit of where you I guess if you were to break your 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 lives into the places that you've lived percentage wise, where you've been because it it seems to have some range. No. Well, it does. And, and actually, I'm a little bit geeky. I mean, I'm m mostly an artist, but I also have an Excel spreadsheet where I <laughs> can tabulate my percentages. And so roughly speaking, I haven't looked at it in the last few months, but roughly speaking, it's about 32% England, about 29% USA, 
about uh, 28% France. Then I have smaller percentages for Spain, Port uh, um, Belgium, Switzerland, uh, and Canada. Wow. You, so you're your own ancestry.com. <laughs> <laughs> you did you did your own uh, what's it called? You know whatever it is, 23 of your own analysis. Even just yeah, where you've I, been. Well, I have. I, yeah. I have my 23 and me as well and they they it firmly positions me as an anglo-saxon mostly from the united kingdom uh, but the complication is that i was born in belgium yeah. i was brought up essentially in france i my first I, I spoke three languages before i spoke one and i now i think my wife and i kind of calculated i'm between 90 and 100 countries that i've lived in mm. i've moved i've, I've sorry, been to and i've changed countries 15 times so that's the uh, the scope of the change Conversations in the workplace. I want to talk about this because you, you addressed this about as you were you were dealing with um, in some of the work that you were doing, and and you and I have a, a similar thought process of the importance of conversation. But I have a, I have a question that relates to something that I've that I've witnessed, and you have as well. Why do organizations forget how important conversations are? What happens in organizations that kind of disconnects them, if you would, because this has been happening across the globe for lots of reasons. But I find inside of organizations, uh, the way that conversations take place could be improved greatly. T tell me why they forget. Well, my, my view on it is that on the one hand, we've created a culture that tends to focus on efficiencies and effectiveness and short-term gains. Conversations like collaboration often take longer and involve things like listening, which means having the time. And I find that f under the name of efficiencies, we'd rather just be straight to the point, get the decisions going and move along. That's in the best of cases, because of, of course the issue is that very frequently we're, we're in a situation where the culture doesn't even accept for robust debate. It's a lot of yesing for the boss. Uh, we have meetings back to back, and there's just no time to salivate and celebrate the types of conversation around meaningful topics. And, and so there's a, there's a second point to that, which is, well, we can have conversation, but as long as it's geared towards exactly what we need to do, and, and that's fine, except we're not allowing for the space for more meaningful topics such as you know how much are we living our purpose every day how often does that conversation ever happen in in a place in 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 work how often do we talk about our ethics it's a it, it might be a piece in an annual report studied and read written by the lawyer the <laughs> chief legal consultant advisor but it's not something we understand it and it's all the more important today, not just because employees want to feel confident and proud of where they work, but we have things like artificial intelligence, which are happening below the belt, if you will, or at least in a black box. And so many top bosses really don't, don't worry about it. And it's certainly not a conversation piece either in board of governors room either. I, I've been, I'm in agreement with you here. And, and, I, and I think the bigger challenge around having better conversations is not the actual act of having better conversations because I actually think that once people get into the flow, they can do that. But to your point and to what you and your project Dialogos is about is it's fostering the environment to have more conversations. How can, how can we help leaders of organizations create this space where it's okay to do that with the understanding, as you just mentioned, time is so precious and, and, there's such valuable components to business, but yet when these meaningful conversations happen, more productive things take place. Uh, people work together better. Trust is established better. How do we lift up the importance of that within an organization from top to bottom so that this is capitalized more and more meaningful conversations take place? Well, I, I've... I just wrote a, a, an article about this and I have these five hacks for doing it, but there's really two that are critical. The first, I'm going to go back to the time story, which is reevaluating how you spend your time. And I think that there are so many people that go back to back meetings, 
do meetings because that's the way things have been done or that's the way things are being orchestrated. And as the leader, it's really important to know how you manage your time and how you can be the steward of everyone else's time. So if you are an exec chief executive, what I recommend is have 50% of your day free. Oh, I love that. And that is not an easy thing to do because it requires saying no to certain things and, and delegating and allowing other things, empowering others to take decisions without you having to be on top of everything all the time. And of course, sometimes, you know, the CEO or the, the, the super boss calls you and you've got to go to a meeting and, and so be it. So it's not about being dogmatic about it, but having that time. The second thing is understanding this notion of purpose. And one of the challenges that we have in terms of finding meaningfulness is really moving from the transaction of being productive to doing things which feel important. Hmm. That's where the meaningfulness comes in. So there, there's a, the part A of this is your personal purpose. As an individual, and I'm talking about the full personality, you as an individual, that's a parent, a, a lover, a, a a friend, an individual stranger in the street, the purpose you hold must cover your full life. And, and how many people have a very precise understanding of that personal purpose? Because if you don't have that, it's sort of hard to know who you are and what truly excites you. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is linking that into, if there is a solid bona fide purpose at the office. In other words, at your company and a purpose, the way I like to position it, Lou, is a purpose is an answer to this question. How would the world be worse off if you or your, and your business didn't exist? Oh, I love that. And therein lies the answer or the way to find a purpose. In the last, look, we'll call it 13 plus years since you've uh, been on your own outside of the, co the corporate world, you've made a movie. You've written different books. You're hosting a, a popular podcast. You're consulting with organizations. Uh, we would call you the the Renaissance man of uh, the 21st century. Here's a question for you. Um, as you look at all of the different roles that you've taken on since, uh, you've broken free from that old environment, if you would. Which of those hats do you like wearing best, Mentor? What's the role that you love doing most on your day to day, the one that gets you the most excited. I'm sure they all do, but maybe one gets you more excited than another. Well, I'm going to, uh, there, there are two things that I like to do that really uh, will capture the spirit of, of who I am and also give me energy. And the first really is doing live presentations. I think that being on stage, I, I thrive on the sort of thespian side of my life. When I was running Redkin, I learned so much from the team about how to have a presence on stage, how to interact, how to engage with your audience, how to read them, change it up, fire it up, when to use silence or when to jump into the audience and all that. So I, I really enjoy that. And my every invoice I ever send is, I expect to exceed your expectations. Hmm. And then the second thing, which is far more quiet, much more, let's say, off the beaten path, is I like to host a practice called an empathy circle, where I invite, hopefully, four people, total of five with me included, to spend two hours practicing active listening oh, great. around a interesting topic. And the, the nature of the empathy circle, something I didn't invent, it, it was brought up by Edwin Rutsch and, and Lee Devay Niesink, is to focus on how you listen to somebody else. And you, the way you do that is you have to reformulate every time you're listening to somebody else in, the, in this structured dialogue. Anyway, so I've been doing, I do about one a month and I very carefully curate the people. We find an interesting topic and we spend two hours. And every time in the second hour, things happen. Yeah. The magic of that bonding through conversation, opening up the chakras, feeling each other in a very different way, which we are, is so rare in today's world. Are you drinking your own Kool-Aid as it related to the advice you were giving some of the companies? Are you able 
in the day in the life of Mint or Dial, able to break your day where you can leave half the day free to use it for creativity, for ideas? Are you able to inject that into each day you do? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of, you know, as I said, I'm a little part geek and a little part creative, but my geeky element is if I were to pull up on my screen, my electronic calendar in Google calendar, you would see everything color coded and, and the way, so I allow people to reserve rendezvous with me through Calendly, yeah. but I'm very punctilious about the spaces that I offer out. Uh, even if it's, I have to change it for North American or Asians, you know, I have different calendar links for that. But generally speaking, my day is naturally free, freed up half of the time because Calendly doesn't allow for meetings otherwise. Right. And then, then I, I color code things like my sports because hmm. I want to make sure that I'm doing active sports three to four times a week. And that's got a specific color code. I have a color code for meeting somebody new which is another part of my connecting dots and, and people idea. So every day I want to make sure that I'm meeting somebody new, meeting it hopefully deeply, but at least making some kind of contact with somebody new and listening to their story. And that kind of, that's how I try to mobilize myself. I want to ask this question because we both sit in the same chair and that is um, the benefit that you have had in hosting Mentor Dialogue's podcast, Mentor, Mentor Dialogue podcast, the Mentor Dialogue podcast, excuse me, and in doing it, because obviously you're taking a very active listening role, but uh, share, obviously the listeners are getting to connect with some of the amazing guests and people that you've had on the program. What gift have you received from hosting this program? Well, many. Um, first is, I, it's made me read at least one book a week. I probably read between two and three books a week. So I'm always reading. I'm, I'm generally asking authors to come on to my show, but not always. And, and in that reading or in the research that I do for each of my shows, I always feel like it's, it's interesting to delve into somebody and then to see maybe the differences between what's written and what is, who the person is. And ultimately, there's something special, Lou, about the record button. <laughs> When you punch that button with ever whomever you're speaking, that naturally influences the nature, the tenure, timbre of the conversation. And for example, Lou, my 500th English podcast, because I also do it in French, my English podcast, my 500th episode, which will be breaking at the beginning of the year, will be with my father. Oh, nice. And, and two and a half hours. Two and a half hours with your dad. I like it. Uh, just uh, I, when, when do we, we'll have to tune. We'll put the links in the show notes for when that one comes out. And uh, that's awesome that you get to have the opportunity to do that. And I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, 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 I guarantee you the, the, the mic will probably flip around a little bit, I'm sure, on some of the who's going to be hosting that particular show. I, I, I'm, I'm piecing all this together, Minter, and, and obviously you have all these wonderful things. And, and what's so great to see is that you truly are living your passion each and every day, which is why you're on Thrive Loud and why you are here today. Yet we all know, we all have days when we're not quite kicking on all cylinders and we're a little off our game. Minter Dial, when you have trouble thriving, what practice do you seek or maybe which individual do you seek out to get yourself back on the thriving track? Well, um, so there are a couple of things that I, I, I do as a regular practice, really every day. And the first of them is I walk between one hour and one and a half hours for my day. So that can involve just going somewhere or going for a walk. And London is such a green town. I don't care if it's raining. I'll still use an <laughs> umbrella. And I find that interesting too. And, um, and the second thing is I, my morning start, starting point. I've been meditating now for, I can't count exactly, but maybe eight years every morning. Impressive. And, and the, the new thing I did was I started stretching. So I thought of stretching my body as well as my mind, which would be a, a good combination. I'm no yoga specialist or anything like that, but I, I enjoy that idea. And I'm very excited to say that a couple of days ago, I actually figured out, managed to kiss my toe yet again, uh -huh. one more time wow. since probably being a baby. So what I, I, I suppose I do is I, I, I spend some time with myself 
when I'm not feeling great. And there have been plenty of times, Lou, that I haven't been feeling great. Yeah. And I've been trying to be more cognizant of that instead of just sort of brushing it off and say, oh, I can get over this. You know, I'm bigger than this. That sort of stiff upper lip approach, being a little bit more aware of it and then figuring out how to get through it. So things that do help also are having great conversations, intimate conversations. Yeah. And they can be with a stranger on a bus. It's amazing. I had this fantastic conversation with a Filipino woman who was head of the cabin, you know, purser for Emirates Airline. And a new woman who's seen the world many times over. We talked about our different languages and our different lives. And, and it was about a 25-minute conversation, but it, you know, it was an energizing thing. And so connecting with people helps to energize. Sports, for sure, helps me to stay feel fit. And, and it's an activity that gets the endorphins going. And I think that's useful. You got to do stuff. Because if you just sit and mope around, problem. Yeah. Listeners need to know that he is a serious racket sport player. I, I think that's what we discussed when I was on his program or when after the record button, if you could see there's a tennis ball behind me too. And uh, mm -hmm. note, to, note to mentor here, um, I played pickleball last night. And here's one thing to talk about getting the endorphins going. When you, you play until about 10 p.m. at night, it is very difficult to get to sleep after having a fun uh, activity that you go through. I, I love all the things you're so doing. True. I love all the things you're doing. And I, and I think... It's really interesting to learn, obviously, the ability for you to want to have these conversations and this diverse nature of who you've been in all these different places you've been provides such an interesting spectrum, um, enabling you to, to take in different cultures, different methods, different businesses. And obviously, I'm sure in consulting and the work that you do, you're connecting with these different organizations and trying to see all the different cultures and places, which means you love to go around and check all these things out, which is awesome. Here's what I want to do, Mentor. I want to go through the admin part of the show right now. Then we're going to have a little fun version of Fun Street here on Thrive Loud. Share with the listeners all the places people can find you, learn about you. We will put it all in the show notes, but it gets way more engagement when they hear it from you. Hmm. Well, I, I, I suppose my major hub is uh, a Google-friendly mentordial.com, which um, where I have my podcast is hosted, uh, where you can find about all my books, which are generally available on all the uh, usual e-commerce platforms, as you can imagine. I've got The Last Ring Home, which is the film, which also has its own website where you can get the book. And I'm happy to send a signed copy of The Last Ring Home, which accompanies the PBS film of the same name. Then I've got uh, Future Proof, Artificial Empathy, and You Lead, which is my last book about leadership. And... Um, then otherwise, my podcast, uh, you can find that on all the podcast services, Minter Dialogue, pretty helpful, play on words. And then my last project uh, that's, I think, worthwhile, hopefully, is on Substack, which is a really interesting platform. And what I've been doing, Lou, is writing this book one week at a time, hmm. one chapter at a time, and then publishing it, and then having commentary, conversation around conversation, which naturally has evolved and impacted the content of the following chapters and uh, that's been the ongoing conversations called dialogos and it's minter.substack.com listeners need to know i mean if you haven't figured out this is the much more handsome and better sounding version of lou diamond here i mean he talks about connecting his podcast name and show are blended together with everything that he does in minter dial and, and inter dialogue i love that and by the way minter is is minter short for something that's not a name that i i am as most familiar with the, the significance of minter well you're never gonna i at least i haven't found another first name minter yeah. but minter is a last name yes it came out of britain um, many centuries ago as the person who makes money that's a minter and there are there were a couple of famous a tennis player, Australian women tennis players, Anne and Elizabeth Minter. Yeah. There was a very famous uh, middleweight European champion, Alan Minter. Uh, but it became, so it was a last name. And as back in the beginning of the 20th century, often you had lots of kids. In this case, my grandfather had eight kids with two different wives. And they ran out of names or, or needed new names. <laughs> they just borrowed my great-grandmother's maiden name. There you go. Okay. And switched it into my grandfather's middle name. So he, the man who was the officer in the Navy and was killed, he was called Nathaniel Minter Dial. Got it. And I'm called exactly the same. Love it. 
ready to go down fun street with me here mentor i know you've been having fun the whole time this, you. as you could tell oh, who, yeah, who totally. could who would not want to talk to this guy with all the the blend of his accents bl- merging together i am gonna have to plenty tune- of people i'm good oh, yeah i don't believe that for a minute i'm gonna have to tune in and listen to your french podcast i don't speak french but i just want to kind of hear how that rolls and how much fun how much by the way challenge in flipping the switch in hosting shows in both english and in and in french no, not for you. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 my wife is French and we speak French as my, my first language at home. And then uh, I, I speak I, my game paddle tennis. Yeah. El paddle es un juego español. Sí. Y, and I, so I'm always channeling my uh, Spanishness uh, playing paddle. Mentor, share with the listeners what you shared with me as one of your all-time favorite movies. Ah, well, so... This is a book that I fell in love with when I was at university. I was always a little bit, as I said, creative, a little bit poet, a little bit writer. And this is a book that's also an amazing film. Yeah. And it's rare to have uh, this idea that the film could even be as good as the book. So the book is Dr. Zhivago. Sorry, the film is Dr. Zhivago. And it really encompasses, I love Russian. I, I learned to speak a good level of Russian. I love the, the soul, the depth of it, and and the... The amazing emotions that you have in in sadness as well as in happiness and i think that it it really r- r- feels fulfilling when i read it i think uh, i think well, i write i like to write every morning i don't have snow out my window <laughs> but that that vision of Zhivago Om- omar sharif writing in the winter in his little dacha that's something that's very romantic for me yeah. and and gives me uh, a chill through it and the love story is so so powerful and and both the book and the film are are monumental uh inspirations for me really yeah uh, the interesting connection to this movie is um both my father and aunt are avid and my mom actually are avid bridge players and omar sharif is oh, yeah. a well-renowned bridge player and they were at some tournament where he was at and he was it was very difficult for others to concentrate uh just because mm-hmm. he was there but uh that's i i have watched the movie and it, it's i never read the book but it is it's spectacular um it's so well done and, and you know you go back i was i always tell this to listeners go watch some of the older ones every now and then to just to see how great dialogues and great conversations take place because i feel I feel that was done a little bit better when they needed to, when you didn't have as much technology and you needed to count more on actors and, and the story uh, versus a lot of other effects that you have in the movies today. Yeah, CGI and everything exactly. else today. Exactly, makes it kind of challenging. All right, so we're going to do the speed round here of Fun Street, Mentor. And I know you could handle this. Uh, early in the morning for me, midday for you, right ahead of the weekend. And I, I know this is right up your alley. I'm going to ask you something. I just want the first thing that comes to your mind. These are things that lift you up, motivate you. They make you feel good. Basically, they make you thrive. Ready to roll? Of course, yes, sir. Of course, yes. Okay. Of late, a song that you love to listen to, or maybe one that pumps you up. Oh, um, Shakedown Street. Ooh, I love that one. By the Grateful Dead. Yeah. Favorite food that is not a dessert. Uh, Indian. Favorite dessert. Uh, so this, yeah. uh, or any any type of Indian like cuisine. The, I got you. Yeah, dal or, and a great um, tikka masala, yeah. chicken, something like that. Uh, favorite dessert? Well, probably very dark chocolate mousse. Mm, I like that. An activity you wish you did more of? Travel. An activity you wish you did less of? Uh, well, this is kind of provocative. Sleep. I feel like I, I have too many more things to do if I could just go without a little less sleep. But I also know that sleep is very important. I love sleep, but I don't get enough sleep. I think I'm, I'm more in the, I wish I did more of it. If I could snap my fingers and Minter Dial could be anywhere in the world, where is he? Argentina. And have you been? I haven't. Ah, this is on your list. I've heard. It's really crazy. Yeah. Out I of all these places you've been, well, you get to practice your Spanish. <laughs> and paddle and your paddle oh that's right they're very active uh, paddle players. they're the world champions uh on the men's side and the vice champions on the women's side i've, I've got this year. i've got two more things to hit hit home on this episode before we wrap put a bow on it and that is one we are recording this literally the day this comes out is the first day of the world cup and we are speaking to somebody who's got some e- extensive stretch of the world first of all are you a football fan 
No, so the right well, football coming I from America. Well, I am Americans. a fan since 1972 of Liverpool. Ah. And, uh, and, uh, and this is a cute story because I went to this prep school in, in, in South of England and at eight years old, I was dropped off by my mom and there I was with 10 other boys, gawkily, geekily, very uncomfortably looking around. And um, I, I looked over at the sky and I said, uh, hi, m- my name's Minter, what's yours? And so he, he told me his name, Andy. Oh, good. But the problem is I hadn't come up with a second question. So then I, I, I stumbled around. I said, well, who do you support? And he said, Liverpool. And I said, can I? He said, yes. <laughs> and then I said, can I be friends too? And that is how I became a fan of Liverpool Football Club and have been ever since. Just to, to flip the, the the switch here, I'm actually a Gunners fan. Don't hold that against me. I'm a big Arsenal fan. Ah, uh-oh. I worked in As the, my father. I worked, I worked in the UK for... Um, a couple of months stint and the gentleman I had worked with at the time uh, had the equivalent of season uh, tickets to, uh, to go see Hybrid the Road. Gunners. And yeah, and it was spectacular and fell in love with the team and still watching. And this is, happens to be a good year. So crisscross your fingers. Although I think the world, Indeed Cup, it is. although yeah. the world cup break, I have a feeling is, is going to chop things up a little bit. Uh, so he gets injured. Uh, th- listeners, this has been awesome. We've had Minter Dial here. Everybody can check out the links. This is the first time ever, uh, not only was Dr. Zhivago listed in the movie, but the word punctilious was actually used on the Thrive Loud podcast. So I'm very excited about that. And I want to continue to have more conversations with you. Minter, thank you so much for coming on the program. And best of luck in everything that you're doing. And continue to have more conversations with everyone because you're doing a great job of it. Thank you, Lou, and same to you. You're doing a great job, and I enjoyed Speakeasy very much and having you on my show. Thank you, Lou. Yes, and he does read the book, listeners. He, he went through through and through, an avid reader. We went through some of the, the ins and outs of Speakeasy when I was on his program. Well, we'll share that link, too, when, when it's available. And to all our listeners out there, thank you for joining us. And until next time, keep moving onward and upward. And remember, be brief, be bright, be gone. When I can hear it beat out loud. listening to Thrive Loud with your host, Lou Diamond. Check us out on the web at thriveloud.com and follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook at Thrive Loud. And check us out on the Good Pods app at Thrive Loud, where you can follow, listen, and connect directly to Lou and all of the Thrive Loud episodes. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.